Good morning. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm James, a uh, kernel engineer from Amazon EC2 um, with my colleague Alex. And the discussion we want to have today is about live updates. So this is something that has been discussed uh, quite a bit. Um, even the KXX session yesterday was talking about live updates. And yeah, so we want to figure out what the right way is to pass kernel um, state across from old kernel to new kernel so that you can boot um, yeah, k-exec, a hypervisor, and keep virtual machines mostly, keep some aspect of them running during during that k-exec. The technical uh, implementations here is, is uh, going to be in PCI and IOMMU and k-exec, but I think the reason that KVM MC is the right MC for this is because the use case is all about virtual machines. It's how do we update the hypervisor, and yeah, so it's thinking about the KVM use case specifically for this. So this is roughly what we'll do. We'll look at what we can do today, what we can't do, possible ways to solve it, and then have a discussion. So live updates, you can kind of do it today. Um, you can carve out a whole bunch of memory as reserved memory. You can run QMU, get QMU to use that a file in that reserved memory pool, like a DAX device um, <clears throat> for guest memory. And you can also serialize states and put it in that pool. And then after kexec from kernel A to kernel B, QMU can start up again. It can use that same file for guest memory. It can read out the state and uh, put it back into KVM, deserialize the KVM state. So you can kind of do that today. What happens if you want to do device pass-through? So you've got a um, PCI device. You want to assign that to the VM using VFIO. And now you do kexec, OK? But that device is assigned, and it's trying to do DMA operations while you're doing kexec. That's when things break, because in order for that device to be able to continue doing DMA during kexec, you need uh, the IOMMU page tables specifically to be left alone so that the hardware can continue to use them. And that's kind of the fundamental use, well, one of the fundamental things that we need to figure out how to solve so that we can do live updates. Um, yeah, so we, we need a way to preserve device state so that we can do um, device assignment while we're doing kexec. <coughs> That's kind of what we're showing with this graphic here. We've added this little contract or little text document to version kernel version A and kernel version B. We need some way of having this kernel state passed from the old kernel to the new kernel. So kexec doesn't zap everything. It can kind of pass some things along and keep them there uh, and keep it in use by the hardware during kexec. So specifically, like I said, IOMMU mappings is one thing. Um, we also need, once your new kernel is started up, you need to kind of be able to pick up that state that was passed along. So how do we expose that to user space so that the new the QMU process that starts in the new kernel can say, actually, I'm the same as the old one. You need some kind of way to expose this to user, user space. Um, and we also want to avoid doing um, PCI probing because that can be, that's destructive to the bars. You have to go and reread all of the bars. So how can we um, pass PCI topology across so that you avoid needing to do PCI probing? And that also to kind of, um, ties back to the kexec talk yesterday when you're know, figuring out how we can do that. There are various other use cases that you want to pass kernel state across. Just another example would be something like SEV SNP where the hypervisor actually does not have access to the KVM state, right? It can't read it out, therefore it can't persist it. You can't serialize a SCB SNP instance. So you need some other mechanism where you don't actually read that state out. You rather just um, kind of know where it is and you pass that information across from your old kernel to your new kernel so it can continue using that KVM state even though it can't actually access it. it can't, the, the hypervisor can't actually read that state. Yeah, and various others. So basically, they you can kind of break these these um, live update uh, bits of functionality into correctness. We like you need to be able to do this so that you keep running correctly. So IOMMU page tables and SCB SNP states are examples of that. You have to do that. And then there are other things where can we make um, live update faster, okay, exact much faster, so that we reduce downtime by passing more information across. Some examples there. Um, and so roughly there are three sort of categories or classes of proposals to how to solve this problem of passing kernel states across. 
I'll go into them in a bit more detail in the next slides, but just as a rough outline, the one example, the one class is we have a memory pool that lives inside the kernel, which is persistent, and kernel drivers and modules can come and allocate persistent memory from that pool, and then it survives across k-exec. That pool is not destroyed. It's not managed by the buddy allocator. Another type is it's similar to that, where you've got a pool, but you put a file system abstraction on top of it, and then kernel uh, modules can access something by a file from there, and um, user space can do that as well. So uh, yeah, user space can uh, put guest state and guest memory uh, in, that, in that pool using file handles. And then the third class is where you don't have uh, pools of memory, but rather the, the drivers and modules are able to allocate <laughs> memory as they do today. But just before k-exec, you have serialized hooks where the drivers and modules can say, this is my state in my memory that I need to pass across. And uh, after k-exec, they get that state gets re-injected back into them. And um, there's also logic to know that, that the memory that's used by these um, modules must not be clobbered during k-exec. So some way of carving it out of the allocator. Yeah. Are these three mutually exclusive, complementary? Sure. Is there a vision for how these would fit together? Yeah, so I, that's a good question. I think at the moment, we've mostly been thinking of them as, as separate, but that's probably not the case. It, like, it, I think they're fundamental building blocks, like the serialized, deserialized framework. If you had that, you could then build pools on top of that, right? Where the pool could pass its extents across from old kernel to new kernel using the serialization framework. So I think that's kind of one of the things we want to figure out, like, are these composable? What is the right way to structure them so that they are composable? I actually don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but basically, these are examples of the memory pool that Microsoft proposed two different ways of doing a memory pool. We, AWS EC2, are going to send out an RFC soon for a file system uh, type of proposal. And roughly, I just wanted to sketch it out. It would look like this, where you would have this file system um, on reserve memory, and then kernel modules can store their state in it by file paths, and you can kind of um, use those file paths, which are actually reserve memory across uh, kernels. <laughs> And then the serialization one, I've mentioned that already, um, but yeah, it's it's a way, provide hooks, serialize your data, and get it re-injected. And one of the complexities here, see that middle line there, complexity. So one of the one of the problems is you, because you don't have a clear separation of this is my persistent data and this is my ephemeral data, and you don't kind of know that upfront. You can have persistent data anywhere in the kernel managed memory and you have to then find a way to um, make sure that you don't clobber those specific pages the new kernel doesn't clobber them yeah go ahead ben yeah, there is a mechanism today in the kernel to uh quote quote serialize and represent device and potentially states that also happen to be in a single relocatable blob and not scattered across it's called a device tree um mm. the flat device more specifically so uh, you could initially uh generate some kind of pointer based device tree and then flatten it at the end into reserved memory uh and that gives you a single relocatable yeah. blob. But, but it's not it's not relocatable because think of things like iommu page tables no, 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 or SCBS, the, you can't move that around right it's the, in use the representation Oh. is relocatable. You're not going to put the IOMU table itself in a device tree. Well, that's you put the reference. Yes, you're always going to have some things that, yes, exactly. but you don't have a bazillion of string pointers all over the place. That's my point. Sure. Like all of the little driver states, all of the little things, all your PCI devices and all of that jazz can yeah. be nicely set in that big contained blob. All right, Quick, quickly, just to preempt that. Um, yes, I agree. We basically have a fundamental concept of metadata and an actual yes, blobs, lots of blobs of, of massive data, which can literally be, I don't know, hundreds of megabytes of page table data, right? Um, for example. And guess pages, I think we need to look at to these slightly them. separately. What um, James is referring to is, should we, should we be smarter? And I think that's also what Sean was trying to get to, right? Should we be smarter um, about putting these massive blobs into something that is essentially like a, 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 a a treasure box to pass them over to the next world that we already know is a contiguous amount of memory so we don't have to go and have like hundreds of thousands of 4k entries that we then go and pass left and right for the metadata 
I have a POC right now that um, is, is on the list, not really, it's only the link to a patch that is semi-functional. But the, the current thing, I'm the way I'm thinking of this is um, exactly that device tree, right? So the serialization path, I think this is part, part of your serialized uh, slide as well. The serialized path creates a device tree, not, not the device tree device tree, the data format of device tree. It uses libftt to serialize itself. It uses libftt to deserialize itself again on the other side. Yeah. And by doing nomenclature identically right now, I'm, I'm basically um, doing something similar to a Rex property, which then gives you the me memory information. But it, it will become super big once we start having literally hundreds of thousands of pages. Uh, Sean was next. I was going to ask, what's the... So there's essentially two categories. You have memory that needs to persist that is consumed by the entire system, so it isn't tied to a specific VM, and then you have a ton of memory that's tied to a specific VM when you get into IOM and page mm. tables and all that stuff. For the stuff that's not tied to a specific VM, what's the ballpark size of how much data you're expecting? So the, the mechanism we have today has close to no, <laughs> no global data. There is a no. bit, there's a bit of PCI data, there's a bit of IMU there. root page but tables, that's not no the VM. Well, sure, okay. But no, the, root, root, root or not? the root is not. Yeah. So there's, there's also some, some IOMU metadata. Um, that just yeah. how, how the, how the, what are the actual groups? What are the group IDs? All of that is also more global and, and than VM specific. There's a bit, um, but it's not going to be hundreds of megabytes. Yeah, it's exactly. It's, it's a few megabytes. Like PCI cache, let's say, dozen megabytes kind of order. Okay, so it's more than a few K, but less than exactly. a few hundred. Megs. Yeah. Right. As we move more and more stuff. Okay, so where I was going with this question is when we're talking about probing, so disclaimer, I know nothing about PCI probing and how the data is stored. Is that something where you actually do need to deserialize, serialize and deserialize, which is going to essentially establish an ABI between kernels? Correct. Yep. Or can you have, is it feasible to have something that sits outside of the kernel but has APIs with, it's kind of API, um, but not as restrictive, and you persist not just data but also code for managing those things, or is that just completely great? Yeah, API is a, it's a problem, right, if you have to maintain that translated. Yeah. One of the useful ways of looking at this is as an optimization, right? It is ABI between one version of a given kernel driver and the next instantiation of itself. It's, nobody else cares. And the new version can look at that and say, actually, screw you, I don't trust you, or I, I have made changes, I don't want that. I'm just going to reprobe the hardware, right? In many cases, for, for the random drivers, you know, the trivial example is loops per jet. Right, you can pass, yes, you can do that on command line as well, right? But you provide a mechanism to pass blobs of data from one subsystem, one driver to the next instantiation of itself, and that's private to it. So we don't have to think of it quite as much as an ABI as we do, you know, a user space ABI, right? And many of those, it's just an optimization. Obviously, there are some things we really care about, like the page tables that have to keep working if DMA is still happening. There are things that are just an optimization, but thankfully page tables are kind of already an ABI anyway. Um, so yeah, there are cases where we have to treat it fully as ABI. You asked about the size of what's being passed over. Do we have numbers for, for Zep? Because we've done this for Zep, right? We're already passing over. And in that case, it's also all the guest pages are marked as persistent to read this and the boot allocator. Yeah. Um, but do you do things like PCI cache in Zen? You don't do that, right? That's in, uh, yeah, that's yeah. Don't do that. yeah. Right. I don't think we have numbers, but uh, I mean, we have a, we kind of feel that it would be a few megabytes, right? I can't remember. We, yeah. We'd have to look at it. But yeah, we've done the same handover for Zen and just serialized the state. We basically used the guest transparent live migration ABI, which was already an ABI for migration in Zen, and passed that from one Zen to the next. Yeah. We, we do have a downstream non structured implementation of this. But we could probably expect numbers there too, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's the deciding factor. Kind of as David said, there is, a, there is the, what we need to do in the optimization. So, for example, in the PCI case, uh, we will need to have a reasonably solid ABI with a complete state of VFIO because that's going to be all the path through devices. But it's pretty simple. There's not a whole lot in there. Um, all the random devices that only exist in the host, uh, we, we don't need to initially. Now, we might be able to speed up the transition 
by enabling those drivers to indeed leave breadcrumbs and avoid redetecting things and whatnot. But that becomes driver specific and, and become targeted optimizations. Uh, so we have some control on the ABI surface here. Uh, and yes, we do need to be careful uh, because we can easily end up into a, a mess there. But yes. Yeah. So what you're talking about is it, it's actually independent of whatever solution we use here for passing state, right? It's, it's like, okay, we have a channel. What does the data look like? And we do need to figure that out. But the other thing that I'm keen to have on in, in this discussion is some of the points that I've got here. Well, exactly. What does the channel look like? Yeah. And things like, do we have a hard separation between ephemeral, non-ephemeral memory? How, what do the, the users, like, um, what do they need to do? Do they need to allocate persistent where they're like, I know that this is a persistent page, or can they just allocate normally and then later say, oh, by the way, these are all persistent. Um, yeah. Anyway, there were questions. So, yeah. uh, can you guys speak about the mechanism you're going to use for persisting that memory across uh, k exec is it going to be somehow a new node being created the nodes being created in the device tree is that the, the handoff mechanism it's, it's a it's a platform specific mechanism on x86 right. you would use setup data on on arm you would usually use the dt because arm always passes dt anyways um that's the two i have implemented so far so, uh, it's, it's platform specific. At, you know using device tree as a mechanism to pass this stuff I'm using the, the data format of device tree to pass it. I'm not using the thing that you would look at if you were looking at device trees usually, which is a lot of standardization rather than the data format, right? So my, my question is, you know, if I'm interested in uh, integrity measurements to be uh, seen across k exec, yes. would this mechanism of passing, uh, at least we have concluded that we can't really you know, pass in a new device tree that did exist before. Uh, you, you, so you're looking, you're looking at, at passing arbitrary data from the old kind to the new. That could be a measurement, but, but it could also be other things. So of course you can. So, so the mechanism we have today is we pre-carve out memory in the device tree that we first have, and then we are taking memory off of that. Um, and so yours is more dynamic in terms of being able to change that from yeah. boot to boot. Right. Um, I don't get the question fully, but sure. I, I mean, if you, if you look at x86 IMA, for example, it, it really is just a, a piece of blob that you pass and use in setup data. And this is just a more structured way of doing setup and, data. And it's something to keep in mind that when you talk about device tree, it, we need to differentiate the device tree as in on platforms that are DT based or have a device tree that is this kind of general top level thing that represents your machine versus device tree as a simple semi structured key value store. And the ability to use that and frag device with fragments, we may or may not be anchored into the device tree. In fact, on, on x86, the device tree doesn't exist. Um, we can still use the fundamentals of the device tree format as a key value store to carry arbitrary piece of information uh, and define which properties we're looking for and all of that. So we need to keep those different. And there is some areas where they recoup nicely, for example, on PCI, we already have well-defined format to represent PCI devices in the device tree. We have code that is currently living in Arc for PCI and Arc Spark that we could move to generic code to resynthesize a PCI dev from a device tree fragment. Mm. Uh, need some work, but there is pre-existing things. Those things aren't new, um, and and there is pre-existing well-defined way to represent some of those things we are after already using that format. That doesn't mean to, it has to be the system device tree and it can just be fragments that are specific to PCI or, or whatnot, but they stand well as well. Yes. I'm just curious, is there is there any overlap with uh, power management, hibernation, freeze, restore? Because, you know, that's kind of similar. The semantics are different. You True. lose different state. And when you come back, you have different state, but it does build a hibernation image. So yeah, I'm that's just curious what two, people think There are two that. Some fun fundamental differences, right? Mm -hmm. One is you are always guaranteed to have source and destination be the same. So you have a, an absolute identical structure format between both. And the second one is that hibernation and suspend don't actually need to serialize anything. They just literally contain the image as is and then just put it somewhere else and put it back up again. 
like suspended RAM, for example, is pretty much a no up when it comes to, to any memory contents. Right? The other fundamental difference in Hibernate is the, hard, is the hardware is not in the state you left it. Say again? But the other fundamental difference mm -hmm. in Hibernate is that the hardware is not in the state in which you left it. A lot of what we're doing here is passing over information about the hardware is in this state. You don't Correct. need to discover it. You don't need to reset it. You don't need to configure it. This is how I left it for you. Yep. That is not the case in hybrid. I'm touching on an import. Sorry, I'll pass it to you in a second. Um, we're touching on an important point here, which is actually a bug in KXEC, in my opinion, and has been forever. Is KXEC today will shut down, will call the shutdown callback of every driver, which is wrong. It always was wrong. Uh, the shutdown callback would potentially spin down disk, turn the hardware off, uh, and things like this. The semantically, what we want is to tell the driver that to leave the device in a state so that another driver can pick it up. Typically, that's what unbind and bind tends to do. So I think we need to look at that, and it's probably the time to start fixing how can exec deal with devices? Yeah. But it's not a the conversation. Question. Wait a second, wait a second. There's, yeah. there's a lot of questions. Over there. Who, who of you wants to talk about the data format? Mm. <laughs> he goes. Okay. Okay. I just want to comment briefly. So one thing that I would really like to do with this is do a DRTM relaunch to reassert confidence in the integrity of my system across that KXEC boundary and to be able to resume uh, with additional confidence in my state now. Uh, as part of measuring what matters or what doesn't matter, I don't have the answer, I just have the, the problem statement, which is the, the data that I pass across, there are some things that are gonna be stable, which are, and there are some things that are not gonna be stable, things that are more tightly coupled to guest state and, and like if you're, if you're passing where, if you are uh, pre-allocating, hey, uh, I want this guest memory to live in this PMM region that I've mm -hmm. statically allocated for it. That's one thing. Uh, if you are gathering pages from all over and doing whatever with them, that's less stable. Um, the stability of data across that boundary matters for measurement. Correct. I don't know exactly, and 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 also separation of. Uh, anyway, so that's something that I'm thinking about. I have to go dive way further into the details to figure out. Okay. the appropriate way to handle that but that is something a relevant consideration for what you're passing around and how and and how you might separate it or not my, my current thinking is to basically make sure that um at least strive to maybe we, we, we won't get it uh, working but strive to always make it backwards compatible right not not forward but at least backwards compatible so that newer versions of the kernel can always read older versions of this this transfer protocol up to a point where you're basically saying look this is this is unsustainable and then we just do a, a swipe and and basically new version and just we'll remove any backwards compat from the beginning and then start from scratch right yeah, just yeah. a couple a couple yeah, major yeah, versions no like fully all together just just like screw the whole thing right um <clears throat> it's probably the easiest way to get this going because I'm, I'm actually pretty sure we will be able to get backwards compat well done with a device to primitive because it actually ingrains a lot of exactly this right a lot of this this notion of I have a versioned device node, I have a versioned field that I can then go and access. And as long as we don't multiply that information by 10 just because we happen to copy it through everything in Hopperty, we can probably get backwards compat for pretty cheap. Okay, and then for measurement, I guess I would write some expression of what paths in my device tree matter for what I... Correct, okay. correct. Your, your measurement Thanks. piece would literally just on boot say, hey, I'm looking at these previous measurements and check whether everything is still there, seat yourself from it. The same way you already do any IMA pass over on x86. Yeah. Just throw it. Throw it. Just throw it. <laughs> throw it to whoever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I waited for a while. Um, yeah. Uh, so, first of all, I agree that uh, device shutdown is uh, not the right uh, callback for that we have. So, uh, I'm not sure if um, bind and bind is the right one. Um, I, I know uh, we, we had something like uh, specific uh, uh, where we QS the devices uh, disabling interrupts, which was what? We don't want to Yes, but uh, what I mean is that we could have something specific for KXEC uh, and uh, default back to uh, shutdown if that one is not implemented. Um, 
but um, yeah, so I agree with that. Regarding the uh, passing the data from uh, one kernel to another, so one advantage that we have today with the emulated PMM uh, when we uh, can pass the at least the user land data today, if mm. we uh, emulate part of the RAM, we, we can. You uh, mean with the MM retrieve. command line param parameter? So, so one of the advantages is that uh, it actually can work with the going through firmware as well, in addition to going through PXX. And we have some examples where we actually go through firmware, uh, both uh, at my previous company and at the current company. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that means that uh, theoretically it's possible to update the firmware as well during the past. So uh, th I, this goes this I goes don't know if you want to. What? I don't know if you really want to. Like there, there, there are no, a lot no. of... What I, what I mean is that... Uh, it's like uh, to, today it's possible uh, with the user land. So if we had a kernel state that is uh, preserved on an emulated PMM device in whatever state, like in a separate pool, in yeah. a, like a regular uh, DEX file system that is access, accessible by kernel allocator or some other mm -hmm. way, it would be we, compatible. We're not with removing any of this. Like like the my, my, my basic thinking, again, is to completely separate these two problems for, for the start, right? So instead of, um, you could still use a command line based PMEM if you wanted to with any of this kernel passover and just continue to use a DEX file system for your user space memory backings. Nothing no, for keep user you from space, yes, so. but what I'm saying is that do not break it with the kernel as well. Allow yeah. it for the kernel. Like your, if you want to you, keep your you, IMMU running. You can't, you can't over reboot because your firmware is going to reinitialize your devices. It's just not going to work. It doesn't have to. The firmware can be taught to skip. Look, uh, look, if you if you have a private firmware that is doing special things that any normal reboot wouldn't do, then make it a special firmware call that you en enable upstream to call as a but, but update the yourself now call. But the problem is that with that special firmware would mean that that special firmware would have to skip special like ranges of memory. Excel, like, but with the emulated PMM, the firmware can be just taught that this part of memory should not be reinitialized, this device should not be reinitialized, and so on. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around how you would keep the IOMU active over a reboot of the firmware. It just so, like semantically, I don't, I don't see how. Like, you, so, you have to go either. You have to you go don't through have to think cycle about for reason. The IOMU specific case, but what I'm saying is that uh, if there are other reasons to preserve kernel data across the reboot, mm -hmm. perhaps allow it by simply. Uh, giving the interface to reboot the kernel from one kernel to another mm -hmm. using this separate pool. That, that's what I'm saying. Um, that one is there. <clears throat> so again, uh, current proposal of what I have, and I'm, I'm going to send an RFC soon, um, is literally a, a pointer to a DT formatted thing in memory that you may as well serialize out before you, you reboot. And you may as well po populate. <laughs> don't, don't over index on the expense of serialize. So I think if if the first step, at least for here, is to like make a list of different tests because we have seen that there are many different steps. Like Ben mentioned, shutdown, yes. uh, serialization of uh, file descriptors is one. Serial, uh, serialization uh, and like the, the one that, that Ben mentioned about shutdown, it's actually the same as kind of skipping the device uh, setup on the next K exec. Well, it's a superset, like yeah, maybe. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a new callback that can optionally serialize stuff. So another part is like figure out uh, like the protocol to pass the serialized data, which can include pieces of user space data when you get into IOMMU, VFIO, whatever. But it can just be kernel data to begin with, for the sake of getting uh, the. Mm. The, the device drivers uh, up quickly. Like yesterday, there was the other KXX talk mentioned the ACPI, yep. and there's no reason to run ACPI after KXX. Uh, mm. So I guess at least we have two tasks. One is the serialization part, and there the prior art is Cryo and all that kind of stuff, and there's something to be inspired about, except that you want to keep as many kernel data structures as possible. And the other is the KXEC uh, revamp. So I think these two are different uh, mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. if everybody agrees. Yeah, kernel data structures are not ADI. Yeah, you don't want to make well, kernel data structures are not ADI, but IOMMU page tables yeah. get pretty close. <laughs>
I had a question about uh, Pcon FS, uh, the slide that you had before. Say again, a question about? Uh, Pcon FS. Yes. Uh, so the first one, the IMME group one, I'm guessing that's an FS DAX. Sorry, are you guessing it? Uh, IMME group one, mm -hmm. right? That's an FS DAX. All I was trying to show here is the IMMU driver can put its page tables in this file system and refer to them by a, a file system path. Right, so this would not be FS DAX. This is a, a different file system called Pcon FS, built on top of reserved memory. This is one of the proposals. Oh, you, okay. you take you take your full system memory and you make most of it owned by Pcon FS, not owned by by the buddy allocator, and okay. then user space can reach into there through file system pods, kernel modules, and devices can reach into there through file system pods, and anything you've got like a clean and hard separation between preserve persistent memory and non-persistent memory. Okay. There's a question online quickly before that. The um, Jumping back to the structs are not ABI, totally agree on that front, but I think you do need to at least call out that you don't want to limit this to just like hardware enumeration. Um, because like, I mean, the loops for Jiffy, which is you know, just comical, but it's an example of you want to be able to, it's very important to call out that you want arbitrary data passing and that you don't yep. want to just restrict yourself to right. other stuff. Yeah, and um, the, these were some some other things that we thought. There was this, again, we kind of had this conversation a bit yesterday about KVM replay state where you can get your VMs running super early if you define like what's necessary to set up a VM and that's stuff that's entirely internal to KVM yeah. basically and pass that across. Yeah. And then the question uh, from the chat was, how do you manage Fragmentation for ephemeral memory compaction would make things complex. I think that is one of the challenges exactly with the de with the serialization deserialization here. You see, I did list that as the complexity of fragmentation. Um, yeah, Alex, maybe you can take that. So the way we've done this in Zen is you have a boot mem allocator and you make sure you've got enough contiguous memory for boot mem. And only after you move from boot mem into the real buddy allocator, and all you're doing there is freeing the pages that are still free. <laughs> At that point, you have passed the live update stream to work out which pages you can't free. And it, it works out quite well, right? That you have, as long as you have enough memory for your boot mem to get to the point where you're priming the real buddy allocator, at that point, you've done enough work to pass the stream and know which pages you can't use. But in theory, your persistent memory can be fragmented all over the, the system, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. And in the Zen case, as I said, it's, that includes the actual guest pages as well. Which it may or may not in the KVM case. Yeah. Does anybody have a strong opinion on what the fundamental base layer should be? I think that's the main thing I want to take out of this right. conference. Um, we can, as you said before, we can stack differently, right? We can stack, we can have a file system as fundamental primitive and then stack metadata files on top that also can have met and blob data on top. Or we can stack a metadata pass over thing on, underneath, like the UI street thing. And then incarnate maybe even a file system or anything else that allows you to propagate bobs over need I'm, I'm like what i'm not able to wrap my head around yet is what is a sensible foundation that we then build on top of i think the answer is going to be it depends because when I mean, like i'm not joking when you get to things like page tables they're just they're 4k line they're massive they're going to cover a lot of state you're not going to want to serialize that. It's nonsensical. You want to pass that over verbatim. SMP state, you're going to pass that verbatim. What you care about is that this page stays there. It's persistent at this exact physical address. For things like device driver stuff, you could serialize to a restricted, bounded chunk of memory, and you don't have to persist a specific physical address. So I think there are, that distinction is going to make the answer it depends. The man on the back had his hand up for a long time. <laughs> Maybe this might not address quite the use case, but I mean, could we just do it all in user space with something like Creu, and drivers would add like a necessary hooks for Creu to save their state, and then just do it all in user space and restore it again? Yeah, it's if, not if this was L4, maybe. <laughs> Is it? <clears throat> it's, it's a kind of comical answer, but like for, for real, um, the kernel only is allowed to trust the kernel for kernel <laughs> metadata. If you were able to, if, if you would give random user space access to arbitrary pages, especially at the end of the boot of, of, of whatever your shutdown sequence is or anything, 
you're completely breaking any layer, layering uh, we have in Linux. But I mean, it would be like the specific apps saving off their state. You know, like if I'm using the neck or you, you have those too. No, you have you have you have that, that. That's a completely separate problem from what we are trying to solve right now. So Creo still exists. Creo should exist. Creo is an amazing approach to save user space, application state. What we are trying to save is kernel. But state. if you save all user space, what do you care about the kernel? I don't yet care about saving user space. I want to actually okay. destroy all user space and recreate it. Okay. I mean, okay. Yeah. Actually, I don't think you do, you want to destroy user space because if you want to preserve, well, yes, but if you want to preserve VFIO, yes, uh, that, that only makes sense if there is somebody on the other side. Yes, okay, exactly. I want to recreate them, yeah. but I, I want to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but That's, I mean, you you have basically. How, how much over time are we? Huh? How much over time are we? No, you are not. I got four minutes. Yeah, yeah, you're awesome. Not. Super simple answer. The whole approach or the whole point of life update in the way we use life update in EC2 is to replace kernel, VMM, libc, everything across that update within less than a second, but ideally within less than 100 milliseconds. Yes, so so you don't uh, have the checkpoint and restoring user space, Correct. but you still have uh, user space itself, Correct. checkpointing itself Correct. and restoring itself from exactly. that. Correct. So, this is where the overlap begins and ends. Like it's it's done by the user space itself, if, instead of being done uh, by Creo. Uh, yes. Yes. Used like uh, you. Mm. User space must be corporate. Yeah. Exactly. User yeah. space. So the the point is, this is also why that I think it's it's good to separate the two things because one thing is done just as a K exact optimization. Just. Uh, <laughs> The other thing is user space that requests from the kernel something specific, such as uh, keeping VFIO running or keeping uh, KVM running. And this is something else that the kernel serializes into his uh, thing because user space has asked to do so, right? Correct, correct. Can I ask, ask a question of like, what, what fundamental thing are we willing to build? The, for, for me, like peak current FS kind of uh, could supersede what we're doing with with device stacks. Like I would, I would love to find another use, like an additional use case for peak current FS to say, like, okay, we, we don't need device stacks anymore because peak current FS can take over these use cases. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is like CXL is going to have the concept of serial memory sharing between hosts, like one, one and so serially sharing memory with yourself from one instance to the next is, is an, another concept. And so yeah, that, that's why I never engaged in P kernel FS. I'm like, oh, it's kind of replacing things. It only has this one use case. I don't, like, until it tackles more use cases, that's why I'm not engaging on it. But Actually, I have a question about uh, device decks. How can this replace it? Because uh, as my understanding is with device decks, we have uh, some metadata right in the device, right? To recognize that this is a, a DAX device and then use that to restore the device up to the reboot. Oh, like what, what, like how exactly do you see that? Like to replace it? I mean, I, I just see this as yet another memory allocator. Like, like we have huge TLBFS, we have mm -hmm. device stacks, and now we have peak FS. Like, it's just like it's got like, some key differences. So, firstly, it's they all able do, right? to be used by, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's able to be used by kernel code itself. Like, like IOMMUs can come and allocate from it. Um, and it's uh, on top of reserved memory, but I think that's the same for. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and this, this is why I think it has the dovetails with CXL because like we, we have people in the uh, talking uh, John Groves that in, here's talking about uh, shared memory between hosts, and he's like, oh, well, I want to build a, a file system for that, and we want to allocate memory, and like it, it's a kind of similar-ish problems where that we're trying to solve and, and trying to like, mm -hmm. how can we expand what we have and not keep creating another memory allocator? But, but they're only looking at sharing memory between user space, right? right? No, I mean, it's, share, it's, it's sharing, between, sharing between hosts. As, as, a, as a file system in a way, right? As, as a file system, it's yeah. still It's still like the semantic is, is a file system, like a traditional file system where user space would access files. Right, yeah. The, the, the novel thing and the very different thing about pKernelFS is that the kernel is the user. And the kernel actually uses it as a base primitive to get a handle yeah. of allocations that no longer be, are anonymous at this point. Right, I mean, but, but that's also useful, like that, that we, like right now we have a choice between you get an entire pre-allocated device and you can, you can online the whole thing as, as user memory, 
but people want this thing in the middle where they want the kernel to get pieces of this thing and 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 use the okay. allocator. So, yeah, interesting. Let's talk about that. Pose a criteria to analyze possible solutions for the format in which you pass stuff over. Looking at it from a language theoretic security perspective, the grammar, the the complexity class of the grammar that you express this format in has bearing on how safely you can write a parser for it. And if we want to reassert confidence in the integrity of the system afterwards, the safety of the parser that has to introspect the potentially compromised data from before matters a lot. So that is the way that I would, it, when I'm looking at whether it's, whether I'm looking at device tree or PKRNFS or like various internal potential representations that PKRNFS might use, um, that is the perspective that I would analyze those things from. The device tree is pretty well uh, established on that one. Then we bound in a single location. That's good. Um, how much time do we have until? Uh, I'm here. Plus one. Plus Last question then. Device tree is no. What kind of following up on this? Device tree is just a, again an arbitrary key value pair. Uh, the problem is what you happen to put in there, and the definition of that is all over the place. And potentially, that's where we need to have some potentially some. Uh, formalism if we want to be careful and, and, and measurable. I don't know quite why it matters because the whole point about the measurement is that it's a chain and you trust what is running and then you measure what it loads and you have to trust that, right? And if the existing kernel that was trusted... Yeah, and so... Correct. So testing the... the Checking the data that it's passing over is pointless unless you're also going to validate that it has left the CPUs in a sane state and one of those secondary CPUs that's supposed to be stopped isn't currently running and corrupting stuff in memory. I don't understand why it helps to measure what one kernel passes from the next, given that you have to trust the whole of the rest of the state of the machine that it left behind. That's why I want to do an I, it, it's, you, 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 it, yes, you're absolutely correct. That's why I think it's important to be able to do a DRTM relaunch as part of that K exec. Yes. Um, last, last final note, final note, um, because I got Steve over to get into this room and I would at least uh, get that into attention. Um, the current RFC I will send is going to implement F-Trace handover so that instead of doing all of this use case, which is the vision and the thing we actually need, we will first start with putting F-trace data from the old kernel to the new kernel, so you can continue F-tracing all the way across k -exec. The main intention behind that is it's, it's a lot easier to reason about data passed through of k -exec than reasoning about safety of uh, passing through arbitrary IOMU uh, data and understanding what handle to use to actually reconstruct the data afterwards. We have a lot of problems. To make that problem set smaller, we will only concentrate at first on passing data as well as metadata. So if you're interested and curious about that, by all means, get in touch, and then uh, we'll work with Steve to get that in. Okay.